Now I want to get you some more practice in a timed environment for the reading and writing section of the Digital SAT. To accomplish this, we'll be going through Digital SAT Practice Test 2, the reading and writing section, module number 2. What I'll do is I'll give you a certain amount of time for each question. Once that time is up, I'll go through and show you my approach and strategy of that question, and you'll be able to compare your approach to my approach and see what you find most comfortable and most efficient for you. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started with question number one, and I'll give you guys 30 seconds to answer this question starting now. All right, 30 seconds is up. Let's go and go over the question. So we've got The Mule Bone, a 1930 play written by Zora Neale. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston Langston Hughes is perhaps the best known of the few examples of blank in literature. And I'll try to fill in that blank before I take a look at my answer choices. Most writers prefer working alone. And given that working together cost Hurston and Hughes their friendship, it is not hard to see why. All right, so we have a contrast uh, right here. We have most writers prefer working alone. And then we talk about an example of writers working together and we state that it's not hard to see why so this would be one of the few examples of something along the lines of teamwork so teamwork is probably what i'd be filling in there if i look at my options then i've got option a characterization that doesn't describe two people working together neither does interpretation collaboration okay them working together that makes perfect sense so b looks or c looks incredibly strong if we take a look at d commercialization well commercialization would not indicate that it's two people working together the only answer choice that does that would be answer choice c collaboration collaboration obviously very close to teamwork two people coming together and working on a piece of work okay so c would have to be our answer there all right moving on to question number two i'm gonna give you guys 40 seconds for this one starting right now All right, 40 seconds is up. Let's go and go over the question. Okay, so once again, I'll look to fill in that blank before taking a look at my answer choice. So we have the process of mechanically recycling plastics is often considered blank because of the environmental impact and the loss of material quality that often occurs. Okay, so obviously we have a negative connotation in terms of environmental impact and loss of material quality that often occurs. But chemists, we have a contrast now. Chemist Takunda Chazovachi has developed a cleaner process of chemical recycling that converts super absorbent polymers from diapers into a desirable reusable adhesive. Okay, so in this case, we have a cleaner process. What we have before, something that's bad for the environment and has a loss of material quality, so obviously a negative connotation. So we'd state the process of mechanically recycling plastics is often considered, I would say, inefficient would be probably what I'd fill in that blank, so inefficient. Let's take a look at our options. We have option A, resilient. We wouldn't describe it as resilient. We'd be looking at something more in the lines of a negative connotation, okay? Resilient would be more of a co positive connotation. If we look at option B, inadequate, okay? Inadequate or inefficient would both make sense, right? Because ultimately there is a negative environmental impact and a loss of material quality. So we would describe that as an inadequate process, okay? And keep in mind that we are describing the process. The process of mechanically recycling plastics often considered inadequate would make perfect sense there. If we take a look at C, we wouldn't describe it as dynamic or satisfactory. We have to show that it's it's an, it needs to have a negative connotation for one, okay? So satisfactory is positive connotation, okay? And in some sense, dynamic is as well, okay? We need that negative connotation because we ultimately show in that next sentence that we have developed some other method that's a cleaner process um, and that ultimately would presumably have less of a loss of material quality, okay? So inadequate would be perfect there. All right, let's go ahead and go on to question number three. Okay, for question number three, I'm gonna give you guys 30 seconds for it starting right now.
All right, 30 seconds is up. Let's go ahead and go over question number three. Okay, we've got interruptions in the supply chain for microchips using personal electronics have challenged an economist's assertion that retailers can expect robust growth in sales of those devices in the coming months. The delays are unlikely to blank her projection entirely, but will almost certainly extend its time frame. Okay, I would state that the delays are unlikely to mess up, would pretty much be what I'd be looking to fill in there. Her projection entirely, but will almost certainly extend its time frame. So mess up's a little bit broad. We'll look for something that has a better, um, better word choice, maybe something that's a bit more fitting to this tone, but for now, we'll just leave that there. So we have option A, dispute. We wouldn't state that it's unlikely to dispute her transaction entirely. Okay, that wouldn't make sense because it's not any sort of argument or anything. Okay, we wouldn't withdraw a projection entirely. Okay, we'd basically be just describing how it's unlikely to mess up the projection entirely, but we, we wouldn't state withdraw there. If we have option C, underscore, we wouldn't state that it's unlikely to underscore her projection. And then we have D, invalidate. Okay, invalidate would make sense. Okay, the delays are unlikely to invalidate, or in other words, um, mess up her projection entirely, but will almost certainly extend its time frame. Okay, so invalidate would be perfect there. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at question number four. For question number four, I'm going to give you guys uh, 40 seconds for since it's a little bit longer. So 40 seconds starting now. All right, 40 seconds is up. Let's go and go over it. So once again, we're going to look to fill in that blank before taking a look at our answer choices to avoid getting stuck between two. For her 2021 art installation anthem, Wu Zhang joined forces with singer and composer Beverly Glenn Copeland to produce a piece that critics found truly blank. They praised Zhang for creatively transforming a museum rotunda into a dynamic exhibit by projecting filmed images of Glenn Copeland onto a massive 84-foot curtain and filling the space with the sounds of his and other voices singing. All right, so basically I would state that uh, critics found this truly, um, I'd say creative, would probably be the best fit. Obviously we have creatively transforming a museum rotunda. Um, so that's a, I would generally try to kind of avoid having the same word there. So I'd actually probably look for something that's a little bit different, but along the same meaning of creative. Okay, I probably wouldn't necessarily want to state creative itself, but that just gives us an idea of what could go there. If we look at option A, we've got restrained. Okay, we wouldn't say that the critics found it truly restrained, okay? Inventive would make perfect sense, okay, because they praised it uh, for creatively transforming, okay, in other words, inventing something new, okay, Museum Rotunda into a dynamic exhibit of by projecting filmed images, and then we go on to kind of describe that, okay, but ultimately, real, the key part here is creatively transforming Museum Rotunda into a dynamic exhibit, okay, so the thing they're inventing is the dynamic exhibit, they're inventing it from that museum rotunda by creatively transforming it. Okay, so inventive looks really, really great there. If we take a look at C, inexplicable, well, we know that it is explicable because we go on to explain it. And then D, mystifying, we wouldn't describe it as mystifying. Okay, there's no textual support for that. Keep in mind, any answer choice you select on the SAT reading and writing section must have textual support. The only one that has textual support here would be option B, inventive. All right, let's go on to question number five. Okay, for question number five, I will give you guys, uh, we'll do... 40 seconds for this one as well, starting now. All right, time's up. Let's go ahead and go over it. Okay, so we've got some scientists have suggested that mammals in the Mesozoic era were not a very blank group, but paleontologists, so we have a contrast here. Okay, so whatever's going to fill in this blank will be a contrast to what this paleontologist says. The research suggests that early mammals living in the shadows of dinosaurs weren't all ground-dwelling insectivores. Fossils of various plant-eating mammals have been found in China, including species like VD, which Lu says could glide like a flying squirrel. 
All right, so ultimately, the researchers claim is that they weren't all ground-dwelling insectivores. In other words, they were more diverse. So we would state that the scientists suggested that mammals in the Mesozoic era were not a very diverse group is probably what I'd like to fill in there. Okay, so let's go and take a look at our answer choices. We've got option A, predatory. That wouldn't make sense. We're not talking about whether they're predatory or not. If we look at B, obscure, okay, we're not arguing whether they're obscure or not. That has nothing to do with the researcher's suggestion right there. If we look at option C, diverse, that would obviously be perfect. Okay, if we take a look at option D, localized, we're not making any argument about whether they're localized or not. Okay, that would pretty much come from a misinterpretation of the mention of China right here. Okay, so try to avoid that misinterpretation. All right, so there would have to be C. All right, let's go ahead and go on to question number six. Okay, for question number six, I will give you guys, we'll do, um, we can do 40 seconds for number six. Okay, so number six, 40 seconds starting now. All right, time's up. Let's go over it. So the way I'd approach this, start with the prompt, which choice best describes the overall structure of the text. So I'm going to try to come up with the overall structure before taking a look at my answer choices to avoid getting stuck between two or being swayed by them. We got the following text is adapted from Gwendolyn Bennett's 1926 poem, Street Lamps in Early Spring. We have night wears a garment, all velvet soft, all violet blue, and over her face she draws a veil. So immediately what jumps out to me is we have personification of night. If you don't know what personification is, it's basically giving human traits or human attributes to something that isn't a human. Okay, knight is not a human, but it wears a garment, which is something a human would do. Um, it has a face, something a human would have. Okay, she draws a veil, something a human would do. A shimmering vine is floating dew, and here and there in the black of her hair, once again, personification, the subtle hands of night move slowly with their gem starred light. Okay, so ultimately what I see as the overall structure is the personification of night. So we'll see if we have that as an option. We've got option A, it presents alternating descriptions of night. In a rural city, in a rural area, and in a city. Okay, there's no support for that. If we take a look at B, it sketches an image of nightfall, then an image of sunrise. I don't really see any sort of image of sunrise, so we can get rid of B. If we take a look at C, it makes an extended comparison of night to a human being. Yes, in other words, that would be uh, there's personification of night to a human. Okay, so C would be perfect there. If we take a look at D, it portrays how night changes from one season of the year to the next. We don't describe the changing of seasons there. That'd be a misinterpretation, so our answer there would have to be C. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at number seven. Okay. For number seven, I'm going to give you guys, uh, we'll do 70 seconds for number seven. So it's a bit longer. Okay. So 70 seconds, I'm going to go ahead and switch to the side of my camera so you can see all the answer choices. Okay. There you go. All right, I think that time's about up. I lost my stopwatch, so um, I went off sort of the recording time, but I think that that's about how much time was left. So let's go ahead and go over the question. So we got which choice best describes function of the underlying portion in the text as a whole. So the way I'd approach this question is I'll do my read through as I do it. I'm really looking for what comes before this underlying sentence and how we sort of transition into the underlying sentence and then what comes after the underlying sentence and how it, you know, is a transition from what came before with the underlying sentence. So let's go ahead and read through. According to historian Vicky L. Ruiz, Mexican-American women made crucial contributions to the labor movement during World War II. At the time, food processing companies entered into contracts to supply United States Armed Forces with canned goods. Increased production quotas conferred greater bargaining power on the company's employees. 
many of whom were Mexican-American women. Employees insisted on more favorable benefits, and employers who were anxious to fill the contracts complied. Thus, labor activism became a platform for Mexican-American women to assert their agency. All right, the function of this underlined part is really to illustrate this right here. The increased production quotas conferred greater bargaining power on the company's employees, many of whom were Mexican-American women. And one thing you can also know is that that comes before a colon, okay? So if you have a independent clause or a clause after a colon, most likely it will be explaining or you know, adding on to what came before it or illustrating what came before it. Okay, so that's just kind of something you can know for the writing section, but it can also be helpful to know for the reading section as well. Okay, but ultimately we see this underlined portion is really illustrating what came before it behind this colon. Okay, so if we take a look at our options, we've got option A elaborates on a claim about labor relations in a particular industry made earlier in the text. Okay, that claim would be that increased production quotas conferred greater bargaining power on the company's employees, many of whom were Mexican-American women. Then we go on to state that employees insisted on more favorable contracts or benefits and employers who were anxious to fulfill the contracts complied. Okay, so that's ultimately illustrating that claim. If we also go up, we actually see that we also state that Mexican-American women made crucial contributions to the labor movement during World War II. Okay, so that would also be sort of a claim that supports, even though that's a little bit further back. Okay, and then we have at the time food processing companies, and that's pretty much just adding on context is what this next sentence is doing. Okay, so A looks extremely strong. We can take a look at B, C, and D as well. We've got uh, B, it offers an example of a trend in the World War II era economy discussed earlier in the text. Okay, no, we're elaborating on a claim made um, earlier in the text. And keep in mind that that claim is really uh, right here. Okay, it's the increased production quotas conferred greater bargaining power on the company's employees. All right, now if we take a look at option C, it notes a possible exception to the historical narrative of labor activism sketched earlier in the text. Okay, we're not noting an exception to the historical narrative of labor activism. Okay, we're actually just going on to provide an example of it. If we take a look at D, it provides further details about the identities of the workers discussed earlier in the text. Okay, we're not adding further details about their identities. Okay, so our answer there would have to be answer choice A. Okay, for question number eight, I'm going to give you guys 60 seconds starting now. All right, 60 seconds is up. Let's go and go over the question. So we've got which choice best describes the function of the underlined sentence in the text as a whole. So what I'll look to do once again is look at the sentences that come before it, see how they transition or connect to this sentence. In this case, there's no sentences that come after it. So let's go ahead and read through. The following text is adapted from Zora Neale Hurston's 1921 short story, John Redding Goes to Sea. John is a child who lives in a town in the woods. Perhaps 10-year-old John was puzzling to the folk there in the Florida woods, for he was an imaginative child and fond of daydreams. The St. John River flowed a scarce 300 feet from his back door. On its banks at this point grow numerous palms, luxurious magnolias, and bay trees. On the bosom of the stream float millions of delicately colored hyacinths. All right, so this is pretty much discovering sort of the air, or, or describing the area from here to here. Okay, then we have John Redding loved to wander down to the water's edge and cast, casting in dry twigs, watch them sail away down the stream to Jacksonville, the sea, the wide world, and he wanted to follow them. Okay, so this is basically stating that John wants to um, essentially leave the Florida woods, go find exploration elsewhere around the whole wide world. Okay, so basically this is just stating that John wants to go explore beyond where he currently is. We've got option A, um, it provides an extended description of location. We're not providing an extended description, so we can get rid of that. B, it reveals that some residents of John's town are confused by his behavior. That's not the function of the underlying sentence. Okay, we know that that's um, sort of the sentence up here. And that's one thing you do want to watch out for on questions where you're dealing with underlined sentences is it might state what the function is of a different sentence that isn't the underlying sentence. And you got to get rid of those because obviously you're asked about the underlined sentence. If you take a look at C, it illustrates the uniqueness of John's imagination compared to the imaginations of other children. 
Okay, once again, that is not the function of the underlying sentence. If we look at option D, it suggests that John longs to experience a larger life outside the Florida woods. That's perfect. Okay, that's showing that he wants to go explore beyond where he currently is, that he longs for this life outside the Florida woods. Okay, it states he wanted to follow them to the whole wide world. All right, let's go ahead and go on to question number nine. For question number nine, I'm going to give you guys 40 seconds. Okay, 40 seconds starting right now. Okay, time's up. I want to give you guys 50 seconds instead because I realized that this is a little bit of a longer question. Um, so I did give you guys 50 seconds instead of, I believe I stated 40. So let's go and go over this question. So we got according to the text, what's true about Dorian? So this is basically a reading comprehension question. One of the pieces of strategy I have for reading comprehension questions, if you're someone who's bad at reading comprehension, is just really try to make sure that you are finding the answer that has textual support. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over what's true about Dorian. So we've got the following text is adapted from Oscar Wilde's 1891 novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray is taking his first look at a portrait that Hallward has painted of him. Dorian passes listlessly in front of his picture and turned towards it. When he saw it, he drew back. His cheeks flushed for a moment with pleasure. He, a look of joy came into his eyes as if he had recognized himself for the first time. He stood there motionless and in wonder, dimly conscious that Hallward was speaking to him, but not catching the meaning of his words. The sense of his own beauty came on him like a revelation he had never felt it before. All right, so that basically, if I was to sum up kind of the main idea here, it's basically that Dorian sees this picture of himself and he likes it. He thinks that he looks good. All right, so we've got option A. He wants to know Hallward's opinion of the portrait. Okay, that's not supported anywhere. Okay, so we can get rid of A. If we take a look at B, he's delighted by what he sees in the portrait. Yes, that's pretty much what the whole text is about. It's the fact that he likes the way he looks in it. Okay, so he's delighted by what he sees in the, in the portrait. Tons of textual support. If we take a look at C, he prefers portraits to other types of paintings. Okay, it doesn't state that anywhere. And once again, you need to make sure you get rid of answer choices that don't have textual support. And then if you look at D, he is uncertain of Hallward's talent as an artist. Okay, and once again, that does not have any textual support. The only option here that has textual support is B, and for B, there is a ton of textual support. So with that being said, let's go and go on to question number 10. Okay, question 10 right here. It looks like we're going to be dealing with uh, some sort of data. Okay, let's see if I can fit all of this in. It looks like I'll have to zoom out a little bit. Okay, so there's the question. I'm going to give you guys uh, we will do 90 seconds for this one since this one is obviously a bit of a longer one. So 90 seconds starting right now. All right, 90 seconds is up. Let's go and go over it. So what I'm going to do for my approach here is I'm going to start with the prompt. We've got which choice best describes the data in the graph that support Charles and Stevens's claim. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to identify what their claim is. So I'll go to the text. 
Economists Kerwin Kofi Charles and Melvin Stevens Jr. investigated a variety of factors that influenced voter turnout in the United States using survey data that revealed whether respondents voted in national elections and how knowledgeable respondents are about politics. Charles and Stevens claimed that the likelihood of voting. Okay, so here's their claim right here that the likelihood of voting is driven in part by potential voters confidence in their assessment of candidates. Essentially, the more informed voters are about politics, the more confident they are at evaluating whether candidates share their views and thus the more likely they are to vote. Okay, so if we take a look at our data, I'm going to try to find data that supports this claim. So we've got low information, high information, and then we got the scale of voters' political orientation from strong Democrat to strong Republican. Okay, and then we have probability of voting. So what we should see is that those with high information have a higher probability of voting across all of the political orientations. Okay, and we see that that is true. Okay, we see that this we see that the black bar graph is greater than the gray bar graph for all of these. So if you are high information, if you have high information as a voter, you're more likely to go and vote. So we've got option A at each point on the political orientation scale. High information voters were more likely than low information voters to vote. Yes, okay, that is true according to the data and also supports the claim that the more informed voters are about politics, the more confident they are at evaluating whether candidates share their views, and thus the more likely they are to vote. Okay, so A is perfect. We'll take a quick look at B, C, and D as well in case any of you chose that. Uh, B, only low information voters who identify as independents had a voting probability uh, below 50%. Okay, so it looks like that might be true according to the data, but the problem is it doesn't support the claim. Okay, so it has to be true according to the data and support the claim. If we look at C, the closer that low information voters are to the ends of the political orientation scale, the more likely they were to vote. All right, so the closer low information voters are to, okay, once again, that might be true according to the data. Um, I haven't checked if it is, but it doesn't support the claim anyway, so we can get rid of C. If we take a look at D, high information voters were more likely to identify as strong Democrats or strong Republicans than low information voters were. Once again, problem here is it would not support the claim, so we don't even need to know whether or not it's true according to the data. It might be, but it doesn't matter because it doesn't support the claim. All right, let's go ahead and go on to question number 11. Okay, for question number 11, I'll give you guys 60 seconds for, okay, 60 seconds starting right now. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over it. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my prompt, which choice best describes data from the graph that weakens the student's conclusion. So the next thing I'll do is I'll identify the student's conclusion. So let's read through. To investigate the effect of lizard predation on spider populations, a student in a biology pl class placed spiders in two enclosures, one with lizards and one without, and tracked the number of spiders in the enclosure for 30 days. The student concluded that the reduction in the spider population count in the enclosure with lizards by day 30 was entirely attributable to the presence of lizards. Okay, so stating that it's entirely attributable to the presence of lizards, okay, we need to show how that would be um, wrong or find something from the, the graph that would weaken that. Okay, so we look at our graph, we've got no lizards with lizards. We see that the one with lizards, we see that it has a very sharp drop off from days one to 10, okay, and then it still goes down. If we look at the ones without lizards, we still see a decline in the spider population count, okay? So we couldn't state that it's entirely attributable to the presence of lizards because we see that the spider count in the environment with no lizards still declines as well. So it can't be entirely attributable to just the lizards. So we've got option A, the spider population count was the same on in both enclosures on day one. That's not weakening the student's conclusion. B, the st spider population count also substantially declined by day 30 in the enclosure without lizards. Yes, okay? The reason this weakens the student's conclusion is because the student concludes that it's entirely attributable to the presence of lizards. But clearly it's not entirely attributable because without lizards, that environment still had a decline in the population. If we take a look at C, largest decline in spider population count in the enclosure with lizards occurred from day one to day 10. Well, that's not gonna weaken the student's conclusion. If we take a look at D, spider population count on day 30 was lower in the enclosure with lizards than the enclosure without lizards. Okay, once again, that is not going to weaken the conclusion. You have to make sure that it is both true according to the data and also is supportive of your prompt. So in this case, it would have to weaken the student's conclusion. 
Okay, moving on to question number 12. Okay, for question number 12, I will give you guys 60 seconds as well. So 60 seconds starts now. All right, let's go ahead and go over question number 12. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my prompt. We've got which finding, if true, would most strongly support the team's conclusion. So the first thing I'll do is identify the team's conclusion from the text. Archaeologist Petra Vyaglova, anthropologist Zini Lu, and their colleagues investigated the domestication of farm animals in China during the Bronze Age, approximately 2000 to 1000 BCE, by analyzing the chemical composition of the bones of sheep, goats, and cattle from this era, the team determined that wild plants made up the bulk of sheep and goats' diets, while the cattle's diet consisted largely of millet, a crop cultivated by humans. The team concluded that cattle were likely raised closer to human settlements, whereas sheep and goats were allowed to roam farther away. Okay, so we need to support the conclusion, which is right here. I'll mark that with a C. So we've got option A, analysis of the animal's bones, showed that the cattle's diet also consisted of wheat, which humans widely cultivated in China during the Bronze Age. All right, well, if we know that the cow's bones are, are their cow's diets consisted of wheat, okay, and humans cultivated wheat in China during the Bronze Age, then that's going to support the idea that the cows live closer to the human settlements, okay, which is part of the conclusion that cattle were likely raised closer to human settlements, whereas sheep and goats were allowed to run farther away. Okay, so A looks super, super strong. We'll take a quick look at B, C, and D as well. B states, further investigation of sheep and goats' bones revealed their diets consisted of small portions of millet as well. That would weaken the conclusion. We need to support it. If we look at C, cattle's diets generally required larger amounts of food and a greater variety of nutrients than do sheep's and goat's diets. All right. Well, if cattle diets require larger amounts of food and a greater <clears throat> and a greater variety of nutrients than do sheep and goats diets, that's really not going to have anything to do with whether or not, you know, cattle or sheep and goats are located close to the human settlements. So we can get rid of C. If we take a look at D, the diets of sheep, goats, and cattle were found to vary based on what the farmers in each bronze age settlement could grow. Okay. Once again, that's not going to support this hypothesis or support this conclusion. Okay. Option A does support the conclusion there. So our answer there would have to be answer choice A. All right. Let's go and go on to question number 13. Okay. For question number 13, I will give you guys, uh, we'll do, we'll do 90 seconds for this one. Okay. We'll do 90 seconds because this one's pretty long. Okay. So 90 seconds starts now. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys another 30 seconds on this one because it is pretty long.
All right, time's up. Let's go and go over this question. So I ended up giving you guys two minutes because obviously extremely large amount of text in this. So let's go ahead and start with our prompt. We have which finding, if true, would most directly support Suarez, Perez, Huerta, and Harold's claim. Let's start by identifying the claim. So let's go through the text. Mosasaurs were large marine reptiles that lived in the late Cretaceous period, approximately 100 million to 66 million years ago. Selena Suarez, Alberto Perez Huerta, and T. Lynn Harold Jr. examined oxygen-18 isotopes in Mosasaur tooth enamel in order to calculate likely Mosasaur body temperatures and determine that Mosasaurs were endothermic. That is, they used internal metabolic processes to maintain a stable body temperature in a variety of ambient temperatures. Suarez, Perez Huerta, and Harold claim, so now we have our claim, we'll mark that with a C, that endothermy would have enabled mosasaurs to include relatively cold polar waters in their range. All right, which finding would most directly support their claim? So we've got option A. Uh, mosasaurs' likely model body temperatures are easier to determine from tooth enamel, oxygen-18, isotope data than body temperatures of non-endothermic late Cretaceous marine reptiles are. Okay, that's not going to support the claim. Keep in mind the claim isn't about any sort of methods as far as how they determine this. It's about the actual determination, the actual claim itself, not about the methods used to arrive at the claim. Okay, so the claim itself is that endothermia would have enabled mesozoars to include relatively cold polar waters in their range. Option A does not support that. Option A is really talking about the methodology and how they got to that claim. If you look at B, fossils of both Mosasaurs and non-endothermic marine reptiles have been found in roughly equal numbers in regions known to be near the pole, near the poles during the late Cretaceous period, though in lower concentrations than elsewhere. All right, this would not support the claim. In fact, this could be argued that it may possibly weaken the claim, okay, because ultimately if you have non-endothermic and um, endothermic fossils both being found, okay, and keep in mind that it states the Mosasaurs and non-endothermic, okay, so presumably, um, you know, if we are going from the claim that mosasaurs are endothermic, then if them and non-endothermic marine reptiles are found in roughly equal numbers in a region, okay, it would basically insinuate that, you know, the mosasaurs are either non-endothermic or this is a region that isn't actually cold, but that's countered by the fact that it's near the poles, okay, so presumably um, it would be cold. So then there wouldn't really be any support there. That's not supporting the fact that they would be endothermic because non-endothermic marine reptiles also survived and lived there, okay. So we can go ahead and take a look at option C. Several mosasaurs fossils have been found in regions known to be near the poles during the late Cretaceous, while relatively few fossils of non-endothermic marine reptiles have been found in those locations. Okay, this would support the idea that um, the mosasaurs are endothermic because very few non-endothermic marine reptiles are found in these locations near the poles, presumably because they can't survive there because of how cold it is. However, in contrast to how there are re relatively few fossils of non-endothermic, several mosasaur fossils are found there. Okay, so C would be perfect support if we take a look at option D. During the late Cretaceous period, seawater temperatures were likely higher throughout Mosasaur's range, including near the poles, and seawater temperatures at those same latitudes are today. Well, that would, once again, that would kind of weaken the claim, not support it, okay, because it'd be supporting, it would basically state the idea that it wasn't actually cold in these regions near the poles, therefore the Mosasaur's could have been non-endothermic, okay, so that would weaken the claim, okay, so our answer would have to be C. All right, let's go on to number 14. For number 14, I'm going to give you guys 45 seconds, starting right now. I'm going to give you guys another 15 seconds. This does have a fair amount of text. All right, let's go ahead and go over number 14. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with my claim, which finding if true would most directly support the researcher's hypothesis. So I need to identify the researcher's hypothesis. Researchers hypothesize, so there's our hypothesis, mark it with an H, that a decline in the population of dusky sharks near the mid-Atlantic coast of North America led to a decline in the population of eastern oysters in the region. 
Dusky sharks do not typically consume eastern oysters, but do consume cow nose rays, which are the main predators of oysters. Okay, so if you have a sort of food chain like this, I actually do recommend that you kind of write it out. So we've got dusky sharks. Okay, so I'm going to represent that as a DS for dusky sharks. We know that they are going to eat the cow nose uh, cow nose rays, so I'll just mark that as CR for cow nose rays, and then they are going to eat the eastern oysters, which I'll mark as EO. Okay, uh, from here we've got which finding will most directly support the hypothesis. The hypothesis that is a decline in dusky sharks. So I'll represent that with the down arrow. Uh, near the mid-Atlantic coast of North America led to a decline in the population of eastern oysters in the region. Okay, so basically it's that uh, when this goes down, okay, when DS goes down, it will cause EO to go down. Okay, presumably if DS goes down, it will cause CR to go up. Therefore, it would then cause EO to go down since they're predators, there are more of them. All right, so that looks good. Hypothesis looks good. Let's go ahead and take a look at our options. We got option A, declines in the regional abundance of dusky sharks prey other than cow nose rays are associated with regional declines in dusky shark abundance. Okay, that's not even mentioning the eastern oysters. Okay, and it also isn't really supportive of this food chain. Okay, if we have a decline in the abundance of dusky sharks prey, that'd be a decline in CR. Okay, so we can rewrite this. I'm just going to rewrite it like this. Okay, we got DS, CR, EO. Okay, in this case, um, we're talking about other than cow nose rays. Okay, so if we're not even talking about the cow nose rays, then it really doesn't, it's not going to support or, you know, weaken our hypothesis because we're not dealing with the actual predator of EO. So that doesn't make sense. If we take a look at B, eastern oyster abundance tends to be greater in areas with both dusky sharks and cow nose rays than in areas with only dusky sharks. That wouldn't make sense because we know cow nose rays eat the eastern oysters. If we take a look at C, consumption of eastern oysters by cow nose rays in the region substantially increased um, before the regional decline in dusky shark abundance began okay so in this case we would see consumption of eastern oysters by cow nose rays uh, substantially increase so we presume that cr goes up okay eo goes down um, then it states before the regional decline in dusky shark abundance began okay this part doesn't make sense before the regional decline in dusky shark abundance began okay if this right here happens before we get a decrease in ds then we don't know why cr would be going up okay so c wouldn't make sense there if we take a look at option D, we got cow nose rays have increased in regional abundance as dusky sharks have decreased in regional abundance. Okay, that would make sense. Okay, we see the amount of dusky sharks go down, the amount of cow nose rays go up, and therefore we see EO go down. Okay, so D is perfect there. Okay, that shows the perfect relationship between the food chain. We can go ahead and move on to our next question. Okay, so question number 15, a really long one. Okay, so for this one, I'm going to give you guys two minutes. Okay, there's not much I can do to make that show up larger on the screen. So unfortunately, you guys are kind of just going to have to deal with the text being a little bit smaller. Okay, so for this one right here, I'm going to give you guys two minutes starting now. All right, let's go ahead and go over this question. Obviously, a very, very lengthy amount of text here. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my prompt, which finding from Washington and 
Lulantheon's study, if true, would most directly weaken the claim made by people who favor the traditional view of voting of voter behavior. So we need to identify the claim that's made by people who favor the traditional view of voter behavior. Political scientists who favor the traditional view of voter behavior claim that voting in an election does not change a voter's attitude toward the candidates in that election. So there's our claim. Focusing on each U.S. presidential election from 76 to 99, Abonia Washington and Sadinal Mulanthan tested this claim by distinguishing between subjects who had just become old enough to vote, around half of whom actually voted, and otherwise similar subjects who were slightly too young to vote, and thus none of whom voted. Washington and Mulanthan compared the voter, the attitudes of the groups of subjects toward the winning candidate two years after each election. So we got option A, subjects' attitudes toward the winning candidate two years after a general after a given election were strongly predicted by the subject's general political orientation, regardless of whether subjects were old enough to vote at the time of the election. Okay, well, that's not going to weaken the claim. Keep in mind, we need to weaken the claim. If we look at option A, uh, subjects' attitudes toward the winning candidate two years after a given election were strongly predicted by subjects' general political orientation, regardless of whether subjects were old enough to vote at the time of the election. Okay, so that would pretty much be... Um, supporting the traditional claim we need to weaken it if we take that b we've got subjects who are not old enough to vote in the given election held significantly more positive attitudes toward the winning candidate two years later than they held at the time of the election all right well ultimately okay a, a shift in only one direction okay isn't really going to show us much also it states subjects who are not old enough to vote in a given election um how this we're, we're not given the other group of subjects who were old enough to vote so we really don't have anything to actually compare that to okay so b wouldn't make sense there if we take a look at c subjects who voted in a given election held significantly more polarized attitudes toward the winning candidate two years later than did subjects who were not old enough to vote okay so here we see a comparison between the two groups um, subjects who voted held significantly more polarized so this is good because it can go in either direction attitudes toward the winning candidate two years later than did subjects who were not old enough to vote in that election okay that would weaken the claim the claim is that um, voting does not change a voter's attitude toward the candidates in that election. But here we would see, see that those who did vote have a more polarized attitude toward the winning candidate. So if they voted for someone and they win, they're more in favor of that person. And if they voted for someone and that person loses, they're more against whoever beat that person that they were rooting for. Okay, so C looks extremely strong there. Okay, if we take a look at option D, we've got two years after a given election, subjects who voted and subjects who were not old enough to vote. Uh, were significantly more likely to express negative attitudes than positive attitudes toward the one candidate in that election. Okay, well, if they're both shifting in the same direction of a negative attitude, okay, so whether or not you voted or you did vote, both people don't like this candidate as much as when they were first put into office. That's not any sort of difference between, you know, the two groups. Okay, so D wouldn't make sense there either. So the only answer choice here that is going to weaken this claim about the traditional view of voter behavior would be answer choice C. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our next question. Okay. We've got question number 16. So once again, tons of text and data here for this one. Uh, for this one, I'm going to give you guys two minutes as well. Okay, so two minutes starting right now.
Okay, two minutes is up. Let's go ahead and go over the question. So we've got, starting with the prompt, which choice best describes data from the graph that support Taylor and Kali's conclusion? We need to identify their conclusion, so let's read through the text. Perhaps get solar cells convert light into electricity more efficiently than earlier kinds of solar cells, and manufacturing advances have recently made them commercially attractive. One limitation of the cells, however, has to do with their electron transport layer, ETL, through which absorbed electrons must, must pass. Often the ETL is applied through a process called spin coating, but such ETLs are fairly inefficient at converting input power to output power. Andre Taylor and colleagues tested a novel spray coating method for applying the ETL. The team produced ETLs of various thicknesses and concluded that spray coatings hold promise for improving the power conversion efficiency of ETLs in perovskite solar cells. Okay, so we need to describe data that supports this conclusion. Okay, the conclusion being that spray coating holds promise for improving the power conversion efficiency. Okay, so we've got spray coating in gray, spin coating in black. We see spray coating has higher power power conversion efficiency for the lowest performing and the highest performing. We also see that it's higher than the highest, highest performing um, of the spin coating. Okay, so if we look at our options, we've got option A, both the ETL applied through spin coating and the ETL applied through spray coating show a power conversion efficiency greater than 10% at their lowest performing thicknesses. That doesn't even compare which one is greater than the other, so that wouldn't make sense. We take a look at B, the lowest performing ETL applied through spray coating. Okay, so the lowest performing ETL applied through spray coating is right here. Uh, had a higher power conversion efficiency than the highest power, highest performing ETL applied through spin coating. Okay, that's true according to the data. Okay, that also does support our claim. So B looks really good. If we take a look at C, the highest performing ETL applied through, uh, okay, so highest performing applied through spray coating showed a power conversion efficiency of approximately 30%. Okay, we see that that's actually about 17%. So C is not true according to the data. So we can get rid of that. If we take a look at option D, there's a substantial difference in power conversion efficiency between the lowest and highest performing ETLs applied through spray coating. We need to compare spray coating to spin coating. Okay, so our answer would have to be answer choice B. All right, moving on to question number 17. Okay, for question number 17, once again, we got a lot of text there. Okay, I'll give you guys, uh, we'll do 90 seconds for this one. Okay, so question 17, 90 seconds starting right now. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over 17. Start with my prompt. Which finding, if true, would most directly support the journalist's claim? All right, first, I've got to know the journalist's claim. Let's go ahead and read through. While attending school in New York City in the 1980s, uh, O.E. encountered few works by African artists and expositions, despite New York's reputation as one of the best places to view contemporary art from around the world. According to an arts journalist later in his career as a renowned curator and art historian, N. Wazar sought to remedy this deficiency not by focusing solely on modern African artists, but by showing how their work fits into the larger context of global modern art and art history. Okay, so the claims right here that N. Wazar sought to remedy this deficiency not by focusing solely on modern African artists, but by showing how their work fits into the larger context of global modern art and art history. So that's our claim. We've got option A, as curator of um, this place in Munich, Germany, and Weiser organized a retrospective of Ghanaian sculptor El Answatze's work entitled El Answatze, Triumphant Scale, one of the largest art expositions devoted to a black artist in Europe's history. Okay, that's not situating the art into the larger context of global modern art and art history. Keep in mind, larger context here, okay, global modern art. Okay, that's not global. Okay, we've got option B. 
and the exhibition post-war art between the pacific and the atlantic 1945-1965 and ways art and curator co-curator katie siegel brought works by african artists such as uh, malangatana uh, and toured with pieces uh, together with pieces by major figures from other countries like U.S. artist Andy Warhol and Mexico's David Sigueros. Okay, so this is situating um, the African American artwork or the the ar artwork by African American artists into the context, the larger context of global modern art. Okay, we're situating it with U.S. artists and um, art by uh, Mexican artists as well. All for this project. Um, that's about post-war art between the Pacific and the Atlantic. So this is much more global. So B looks super strong. We take a look at C as well. And Wazar's work as a curator for the 2001 exhibition, The Short Story, Independence and Liberation Movements in Africa, 1945 to 1994, showed how African movements for independence from European colonial pro powers following the Second World War profoundly influenced work by African artists of the period. Okay, that's not ultimately supporting um, that we're situating it in the context of global modern art. If we take a look at D, and Wazar organized the exhibition um, in slash site. African photographers, 1940 to the present, but not to emphasize a particular aesthetic strand, but to demonstrate the broad range of the ways in which African artists would have approached the medium of photography. Once again, okay, only answer choice here that's situating it in the broader context of um, global modern art and art history would be answer choice B. So B would have to be our answer there. Let's go ahead and move on to question number 18. I'll zoom in now since we have a shorter question. Okay, so we've got question number 18. Okay, for question number 18, I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds starting right now. All right, 30 seconds is up. Let's go and go over question 18. All right, so starting with the prompt, we've got the generic prompt of conform to the conventions of standard English. If we take a look at our options, we've got some form of use. So I'll go ahead and read through, try to pay attention to anything like tense, subject of um, the number of my subject. Um, one thing that, that I will say I also note here is that if I ever see that I have an infinitive, which I do here to use, um, a participle in having used, okay, and I, I think using is either a participle or a gerund, um, but if I see I have those options, okay, a two infinitive, a participle, maybe another participle or a gerund, um, then I know I'm probably going to be looking to at it basically a finite verb question is what I would call it. And basically what that means is you need to find the option that is a finite verb, okay, which in this case would be have used. So that's probably what I'll be looking at. So I just want to point that out. If you see you have, it, you have, you have a two infinitive and then at least one participle and then maybe the, the third one is a participle or a gerund, you're probably looking at one where you need a finite verb. So I'll go ahead and show you. we got for thousands of years, people in the Americas uh, blank, the bottle gourd, a large bitter fruit with a thick rind to make bottles, other types of containers, and even musical instruments. So in order to make this a full and complete sentence, we need to have a finite verb right here in this underlined space, okay? A to infinitive is not a finite verb, it's a non-finite, okay? Having used is also a non-finite participle, okay? And using, I think, is either a gerund or a participle. So either way, it's non-finite. So the only option here that's finite and is a finite verb would be option B, okay? So you just need to find the finite verb here. So that'd be have used, okay? So let's go ahead and go on to question number 19. Okay, so question number 19 here, I'm gonna give you guys 30 seconds for starting right now. All right, time's up. Let's go and go over it. So we're going to take a look at the prompt. Once again, same thing, conform to the conventions of standard English. We'll look at our options, differences. Do we need a comma here and do we need but after? Okay, so as we read through, I'll be looking for, do we have an independent clause before this comma um, or do we have some sort of dependent clause? So let's, so let's go and take a look. While many video game creators strive to make their graphics ever more lifelike, okay, that's a introductory dependent clause. After an introductory dependent clause, we need to have a comma. Okay, we don't need to have one of the fanboys though because we don't have an independent clause before that comma. So I'll go ahead and get rid of option D. I can get rid of option B and option A because I know we do need to have that comma after lifelike and we see our answer there would have to be answer choice C. Okay, moving on to question number 20. Okay, for question number 20, I will give you guys 30 seconds as well. So 30 seconds starting right now.
All right, 30 seconds is up. Let's go and go over the question. So if I look at my options, looks like I've got different tenses of the word suggest. So I'll basically be paying attention to tense as I go through this. Uh, if we go ahead and do that, I'm um, also pay attention to the number of my subjects. We got in the 1950s, a man named Joseph McVicker was struggling to keep his business afloat when his sister-in-law, Kay Zufal, advised him to repurpose the company's product, a non-toxic clay-like substance for removing soup from wallpaper as modeling putty uh, for kids. And then we have, in addition, Zufal Blank selling the product under a child-friendly name, Play-Doh. All right, so we have Zufal advised him. Okay, so we got past tense there to repurpose the company's product. Um, and then we've got... Let's see if we've got anything else in terms of verb tense. Um, we got was struggling to keep his business afloat. Okay, so this is all past tense. Okay, so we have Zufal advised him to repurpose the company's product. And then we have, in addition, Zufal suggested selling the product under a child-friendly name, Play-Doh. Okay, so we see that we just need to kind of maintain that past tense verbiage. Okay, so we've got option A would have to be our answer there. Once again, we take a look for the other verbs that are being used, and then we just try to maintain that tense as long as there's nothing indicating we need to break that tense. Okay, if we take a look at option number 21, or question number 21, okay, right here, I will give you 30 seconds for this one as well, starting right now. I'll give you guys 15 more seconds on this one. All right, let's go ahead and go over the question. So once again, start with my prompt. Got to conform the conventions of standard English. I look at my differences. Do we need um, a period, semicolon, um, a comma, or no punctuation here. Ultimately, what I'm going to be paying attention to is, do we have an independent clause from producing on? I would imagine we probably don't because we wouldn't really start a sentence with an ing verb like this. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look. We've got Beatrice Potter. is perhaps best known for writing and illustrating children's books such as The Tale of Peter Rabbit 1902, but she also dedicated herself to mycology, the study of fungi. Okay, so she also dedicated herself to mycology is an independent clause. Okay, and then we have the study of fungi. Um, is basically describing what mycology is. Okay, that's just supplementary and non-essential, so we'd offset that with commas so since we start a comma there. Um, so I can get rid of A, I can get rid of um, B as well, because after that we've got producing more than 350 paintings of the fungal species she observed in nature and submitting her research on spore germination to the Linnean Society of London. That's not an independent clause. can't stand on its own as a complete sentence. We get rid of A and B. Then between C and D, we have do we need a comma, do we not need a comma? Okay, once again, we do need a comma because we need to finish off this non-essential part um, that is telling us what the meaning of mycology is. Mycology is the study of fungi. Okay, we need to complete that non-essential by having that comma there as well. Okay, so our answer there would have to be answer choice D. All right, moving on to question number 20. Two. Okay, for question number 22, I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds. Okay, I'll go ahead and switch the side of my camera one moment so you guys can see the question better. Okay, so there we go. 30 seconds starting right now. All right, so this one should be pretty quick for you guys. Um, so we've got an assessing or starting off, right, prompt conventions of standard English. And then if we take a look at our answer choices, we've got different subjects right here. Okay, so ultimately, I know I'm probably looking at an introductory modifier question. We've got an assessing the films of Japanese director Akira Kurosawa. Okay, so that's an introductory modifier. What comes after it needs to be who's assessing these films. Okay, who's assessing these films would be the many critics. It wouldn't be um, Kurosawa's use of Western literacy. It wouldn't be there are many critics, and it wouldn't be the focus of many critics. It would have to be the critics themselves because they're the ones that are assessing the film. So our answer would have to be A. So once again, introductory modifiers. Those ones should be very, very quick questions for you guys. If we take a look at question number 23, okay, I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds for this one as well, starting right now.
All right, time's up. So this question, um, the way I'd approach this, once again, conform to the conventions of standard English, take a look at the differences and all these options. Do I need a semicolon after basic or a comma? What kind of punctuation do I need after 2009? And then what kind of punctuation do I need at the end? Um, if I take a look at the question, I'll probably be looking for some sort of parallelism to base that decision on. We've got Joshua Henson, director of the Language Revitalization Program of the Chickasaw Nation in Oklahoma, helped produce the world's first indigenous language instructional app, Chickasaw Basic in 2009, and then we'll have something Chickasaw TV in 2010. Okay, so I see I've got this semicolon coming after the year. Okay, so I'm probably looking for answer choice C. I've got comma coming after um, the name, basically, of what it was. Okay, so Chickasaw TV in 2010. I'll probably be looking for a comma then after basic, since that's the name, Chickasaw Basic. So I can get rid of the ones with the semicolon. Okay, then we have the differences being, do we need a semicolon? We do in order to maintain the parallelism. Okay, if you have a list and you have commas within each item for the list, you would separate each item then with the semicolon. So our answer would have to be answer choice C. You can kind of get that from parallelism or having that understanding of using a semicolon to separate items where each item has a comma um, within it. So answer would have to be C. We can go ahead and move on to our next question, which will be question number 24. Okay, for question number 24. I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds after I go ahead and switch the side of my camera. So 30 seconds starting right now. All right, this one I wanted to give you guys another 15 seconds, so I gave you guys 45 seconds on this one. Um, basically, just because it could kind of require you to go back to the text a little bit more. Um, so let's go ahead and go over number 24. Okay, so once again, conform to conventions of standard English. I look at my differences. What kind of punctuation do I need between two and springs? Um, so it could be looking basically for, yeah, basically just do we need punctuation there. So let's go ahead and go over it. 47 geothermal springs of Arkansas's Hot Springs National Park are sourced through a process known as natural under natural groundwater recharge in which rainwater percolates downward through the earth dash in this case the porous rock of the hills around hot springs and then we have um, to collect in a subterranean basin subterranean basin all right so uh, since i have this uh this dash here i'd probably be looking at do we have a non-essential piece in here um or do we have um, this just being, you know, sort of an offset for emphasis. Um, it doesn't really look like this would be used for emphasis. So I'm probably looking at something being non-essential. So I'd probably be looking at C. So what I would do now is I'd take this right here and I would try reading through um, without it and see if it makes sense. We've got um, in which rainwater percolates downward through the earth to collect in a subterranean basin. Okay, that's ultimately describing the natural groundwater recharge. So I see that what was um, from this dash until you know the end of springs is non-essential. So to maintain that non-essential dash that we started with, we have to also use a dash there. So our answer would have to be answer choice C. Okay, moving on to question number 25. For question number 25, I'll give you guys uh, 30 seconds as well. So 30 seconds starts right now. All right, 30 seconds is up. Let's go ahead and go over it. So once again, looking at different forms of punctuation, possibly adding a well after varied. So I'll be looking for, do we have an independent clause, dependent clause? What are we working with before and after this punctuation? Over 20 years ago in a landmark experiment in the psychology of choice, Professor Sheena Iyengar set up a jam tasting booth at a grocery store. The number of jams available for tasting varied. That's an independent clause up to varied. Mark that with an IC. After that, we have some shoppers had 24 different options, others only six. Okay, that's also an independent clause. And one thing I also notice is that it is illustrating or describing basically what came before it. So illustrating or explaining what came before it, that's an indication that you probably are going to want to use a colon. Okay, so a colon would be perfect here. We use that colon to connect a second independent clause that is explaining the idea in the first. Okay, so answer choice A would be perfect there. Let's go ahead and go over number 26 now. Okay, so for number 26, I'm going to give you guys 
30 seconds as well. Okay, I will switch the side on my camera so you guys can see the entirety of the question. So give me just one brief second to do that, and then I'll give you guys that 30 seconds. So 30 seconds starts now. Okay, 30 seconds is up. Let's go ahead and go over this question. Okay, so once again, conformity conventions of standard English. Okay, so I'll be looking at, um, do I have, it looks like I'm probably dealing with some sort of list here. Um, we need to know what kind of punctuation we have. Um, could be looking at a list with commas. So we got uh, Nigerian author Abuchi Emet Chetas, celebrated literary ouvre, includes the joys of motherhood. Okay, so we got title here, a novel about the changing roles of women in 1950s Lagos. So we got title, comma, description. Um, and then if we continue on, we have a television play. Okay, so this would be description here. So we'd be giving title as a kind of marriage. So once again, we want to go title, comma, description. Okay, and since we have a comma in our list, we would separate these items with a semicolon. Okay, so we can get rid of A and we can get rid of option C as well. So we can separate them with a semicolon and then we go title, comma, description. So we have title, comma, and answer choice B. Option D is missing that comma, so our answer would have to be B. We need to maintain this parallelism. Okay, so our answer would have to be B. Let's go ahead and move on to number 27. Number 27, I'll give you guys 30 seconds for as well, starting right now. All right, 30 seconds is up. Let's go and go over it. So transition question, okay, you'll notice that by the prompt. So with the transition question, what I'll be doing is I'll be basically trying to come up with my, my own transition before taking a look at the answer choices. That way I'm not misled or stuck between two. So we've got uh, Chimamanda um, N. I. Dichi's 2013 novel, Americana, chronicles the divergent experiences of Ifemelu and Obinze, a young Nigerian couple after high school. Ifemelu moves to the United States to attend a prestigious university, blank, Obinze travels to London, hoping to start a career there. However, frustrated the lack of opportunities, he soon returns to Nigeria. All right, so basically, I'd be looking for something um, indicating basically at the same time or meanwhile would be really good transitions. It looks like we have meanwhile as an option. Okay, so that'd be perfect. Ultimately, we need to indicate these things are happening at the same time. Uh, we wouldn't state that it's nevertheless because that would basically be, um, you know, stating kind of um, in contrast or in spite of sort of what came before it. So that wouldn't really make sense. Um, if we've got uh, option C, we've got secondly, it's not happening after, and we aren't, you know, trying to stress that, you know, it's, you know, a fact or anything like that. It's just at the same time. So meanwhile, is perfect there. Uh, we can go and take a look at question number 28 or yeah, there it is. 28. Okay. So question number 28, I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds for as well, starting right now. All right, time's up. Let's go over it. Another transition question. So basically, once again, try to fill in this blank before taking your answer choices. You want to base it on what came before, what's coming after. So we've got what organisms have evolved a number of surprising adaptations to ensure their survival in adverse conditions. Tadpole, tadpole shrimp embryos, blank can pause development for over 10 years during extended periods of drought. This is an example of how organisms have evolved ad adaptations to ensure their survival in adverse conditions. So since this example, I'd be looking for something like for example, or for instance, uh, we've got option A in contrast. We're not dealing with contrast. For example, would be perfect because we're providing an example. Meanwhile, this isn't happening at the same time. And this isn't a consequence of what came before it. Our answer there would have to be B. Let's go ahead and move on to number 29. Number 29, I'll give you guys 30 seconds for as well, starting right now.
All right, let's go ahead and go over this question. Okay, so we got, once again, transition question. So I'll be looking to come up with my own answer choice based on what came before, what comes after. In 1933, 20th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was ratified. The amendment mandates that presidential inaugurations be held on January 20, approximately 10 weeks after the November election. Blank this amendment requires newly elected U.S. senators and representatives to be sworn into their respective offices on January 3. Okay, so this one's January 20. This one's January 3. Uh, both of the, you know, the same amendment here is requiring two different things, one of the president, one of senators and representatives. Um, we wouldn't state, this isn't really a contrast. So I wouldn't state instead. Um, it's not instead this amendment requires. The amendment requires both things. So I'd probably be looking for something that's, you know, in addition or something like that. Um, or additionally, we got B, for instance. We're not providing an example of what came before. Uh, C, specifically. Okay, this isn't, you know, specifically this amendment requires. We already stated one of the things the amendment requires. Now we're stating another thing the amendment requires. Okay, mandates and requires mean pretty much the same thing. Um, so basically two things. Second one, we want to state that it's in addition, additionally, something like that. So D would be perfect there. Okay, let's go ahead and go up to number 30 now. Okay, for question number 30, I'm going to give you guys... Uh, 30 seconds for this one as well. So 30 seconds starting right now. Okay, 30 seconds is up. Let's go and go over the question. Once again, dealing with transition, same thing. Try to fill in this blank. Base it on what came before, what comes after. In her poetry collection, Thomas and Buela, Rita Dove interweaves the uh, characters' personal stories with broader historical within with broader historical narratives. Okay, so that's a claim basically. Uh, she places Thomas's journey from the American South to the Midwest in the early 1900s within the larger context of the Great Migration. So this illustrates the claim. So first example of illustrating our claim. Then we have. Uh, blank dove sets events from Buela's personal life against the backdrop of the U.S. civil rights movement. That's a second example of the claim. Um, we wouldn't use for example, though, because we already gave one example. Now we're giving a second one. Um, so it could be looking at, at something like, you know, in addition to additionally, um, something along those lines. We've got option A specifically. OK, that wouldn't make sense for this transition. Thus, it's not a, it's not, you know, an effect of what came before. it. It's not being caused by what came before it. Uh, it's not in spite of what came before it, so regardless, wouldn't make sense. Similarly, it would make sense here, okay? Similar to what came before it, so similar to this first example. The second example also is illustrating this claim, so similarly there would be perfect. Uh, we can go ahead and take a look at question at number 31 now, okay, for 31. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch the side of my camera so you guys can see the entirety of the question. Okay, I'll have to zoom out a little bit as well. Okay, for this one, I'll give you guys, uh, we will do 60 seconds for this question, so 60 seconds starting right now. All right, 60 seconds is up. Let's go over it. So starting with the prompt, okay? So you have your generic part of the prompt right here, which is which choice most effectively uses relevant information from notes to accomplish this goal. That's the generic part. You don't need to focus on that as much. You want to really focus on this part. So the student wants to emphasize the distance covered by the Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike. So we want to make sure that we are addressing the prompt. All right, so let's go ahead and go through our notes. We're researching a topic. Students taking the following notes. Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike was a road built between 72 and, or 1792 and 1794. It was the first private turnpike in the United States connected Philadelphia and Lancaster. Lancaster and Pennsylvania. It was 62 miles long. So this 
this is the distance that we're looking for. If you look at option A, we have the 62 mile long Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike connected the Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania cities of Philadelphia and Lancaster. That looks really great. We'll take a look at B as well. Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike was first private turnpike in the United States. That doesn't mention the distance. We have C, um, the turnpike connected two cities. It doesn't mention distance. We get rid of C. D also does not mention our distance. Answer would have to be A. Okay, we need to emphasize the distance covered by the Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike. Only answer that does that is answer choice A. So it has to be our answer there. I, I realize I probably just spoke really quickly on that one. Um, so I apologize if I spoke too quickly on that question. But uh, here is question number 32. For question number 32, I'm going to give you guys 90 seconds for it starting right now. All right, time's up. Let's go ahead and go over number 32. So once again, start by taking a look at my prompt. The student wants to emphasize the aim of the research study. So as I read through these notes, I want to find what the aim of the research study is. Most but not all of the moon's oxygen comes from the sun through solar wind. Uh, Cosmio chemist, Cosmio chem, Cosmo chemist Kentaro Terada from Osaka University wondered if some of the unaccounted some of the unaccounted for oxygen could be coming from Earth. Okay, so that's his question. And then we have in 2008, he analyzed the data from Japanese satellite Kaguya. Kaguya gathered data about gases and particles in Cairo orbiting the moon based on the data. Uh, Tarada confirmed his suspicion that the Earth is sending oxygen to moon. Okay, so ultimately the aim of the study is to answer this question here, which is um, if some of the unaccounted for oxygen could be coming from Earth. So if some of the unaccounted for oxygen on the moon could be coming from Earth. So ultimately we need to emphasize the aim we have option a as it orbited the moon the satellite collected data that was later analyzed that's not explain that's not emphasizing the aim of the study b before 2008 uh, Tarada wondered if the moon was receiving some of its oxygen from earth that's not great because it really doesn't talk about um the aim saying that someone wondered something isn't really stating um or emphasizing the aim of the study it also doesn't even mention the study which i don't like i think we should mention the study if we're stating the aim of it um so i'll leave b kind of as you know pretty much 75 percent crossed out for now if we take a look at c uh, cosmo chemist kantaro Tarada set out to determine whether some of the moon's oxygen was coming from earth okay that's perfect okay because we are introducing um, you know, the Cosmo Kettis, um, saying that he set out to determine is basically stating that, you know, he's going to be doing a study. Okay. And then we state, here is the aim of the study, whether some of the moon's oxygen was coming from the earth. Okay. So that's perfect there. C is great. We can go and take a look at D we've got Kentaro Tarada's study determined that earth is sending a small amount of oxygen to the moon. We don't want the results. We want to emphasize the aim of the research study, which C does perfectly. So we can go and move on to question number 33 for number 33. I'm going to give you guys 90 seconds as well, starting right now.
All right, time's up. Let's go ahead and go over the question. Okay, so we've got prompt. Student wants to present the study and its methodology. So I want to identify what the study is, what its methodology is. Okay, so let me just make sure I'm recording. Okay, I am still recording. Great. All right. So once again, we want to present the study and its methodology. Let's identify both of those. We've got ducklings expend up to 62.8% less energy when swimming and align behind their mother than when swimming alone. Physics behind this energy savings hasn't always been well understood. Naval architect Ziming Wan used computer simulations to study the effect of the mother duck's wake. So this is how, um, this is our methodology, computer simulations. A study revealed that ducklings are pushed in a forward direction by the wake's waves. Uh, Yuan determined... This push reduces the effect of wave drag on the ducklings by 158%. Okay, so present st its study and its findings, or and its methodology, not its findings. Okay, so we've got option A. A study revealed that ducklings, which expend up to 62.8% less energy when swimming in a line behind their mother, also experience 158% less drag. That's focusing on the findings, and it never mentions the methodology. We need to mention the methodology. Option B, seeking to understand how ducklings swimming in a line behind their mother save energy. So that's presenting basically what the aim of the study is. And then we have uh, Ziming Wan used computer simulations to study the effect of the mother duck's wake. So then we're introducing our methodology. So B looks perfect. We can take a look at C and D as well. Uh, we've got Ziming Yuan studied the physics behind the fact that by being pushed in a forward direction by waves, ducklings save energy. That never mentions the methodology, which is computer simulations. We've got option D, naval architect Ziming Yuan discovered that ducklings are pushed in a forward direction by the waves of their mother's wakes, reducing the effective drag by 158%. Once again, we never talked about methodology in any of these options except for B, so B would have to be our answer there. So we can go ahead and circle B. Now I want you to get more time practice for the math section. To accomplish this, I want you to take Digital SAT Practice Test 1's Math Module 2. Please take the non-adaptive version from the College Board's website. Open it up as a PDF and take it timed for 43 minutes. You'll notice the timing is different from the timing you receive when you take the Digital SAT through Blue Book because there are more questions on the non-adaptive version. The reason I am having you use the non-adaptive version in this course is because it would be nearly impossible for me to teach if everyone used the adaptive versions on Bluebook since some people would get different questions than others. Once the time is up, you'll see me do a speed run of the same math module you are about to complete. You can use it to compare your strategies for each question against mine and see if the strategies you are using are efficient or if there are more efficient approaches that you may want to adopt in the future. With that being said, time starts now.
Thanks for completing practice test one's second math module. Now you'll see me perform a speed run of the same module you just completed. Please compare your strategy for each question to mine and see if you are comfortable with the way you solve the question or if you may want to adopt my approach or strategy. I recommend you use whatever approach and strategy you find most efficient and comfortable for you, even if that is not the strategy that I employ. With that being said, here's the speed run. First, Tilly earns P dollars for every W hours of work, which expressions represents the amounts of money Tilly earns for 39 W hours of work. Okay, well, 39 W hours of work. Sorry, that should be 39. Let me erase that. Should be 39 W hours of work. It's the amount she works, she earns P dollars per every W hours of work. So P dollars per W hours of work. W is canceled. The amount she'll get paid is 39P. 39P. Okay, so answer has got to be A. Moving on to number two. For a training program, Juan rides his bike at an average rate of 5.7 minutes per mile. Which function M models the number of minutes it will take Ron to ride X miles at his rate? Well, every mile that he rides adds on another 5.7 minutes. There's no like initial amount, so that would just be M of X is equal to uh, 5.7 minutes per mile, 5.7 X. And so there's got to be D. We're not dealing with any sort of, you know, Ys or anything and no division. Moving on to number three, we've got, let me go ahead and switch sides of my screen once again. I'm guessing just switching sides on my screen has probably taken up a lot of time um, on this video, but anyways, it's not a big deal because it gives you a chance to subscribe every time. Anyway, here's number three. The solution to the given system of equations is xy. What's the value of y? Okay, I see I've got 3x and negative 3x. I'll go ahead and sum these, get rid of my 3x's, then I'm going to be left with y is equal to 12 minus 6, which means the value of y must be 6. Moving on, we got number uh, four. We've got x is equal to 40 plus 3t. Equation gives speed in miles uh, per hour of a certain car t seconds after it began to accelerate. What is the speed in miles per car? of the car five seconds after it began to accelerate, just plugging in five for T, three times five is 15, 40 plus 15 is 55, and so there's gotta be D. We can go ahead and move on to number five. I'm gonna go ahead and switch sides on my screen again. Okay, here's number five. Looks like we got a triangle with A, C, and B. Uh, right triangle shown, A is four, B is five. Which expression represents the value of C? That's gonna be root four squared plus five squared. Um, root four squared plus five squared, okay, that's a D. Number six, what's the solution to the given equation? Uh, subtract five from both sides, 160 is four X, divide both sides by four, X is gonna have to equal 40. That's the solution. Moving on to number seven, going ahead and switching sides on my screen again. Okay, go ahead and get the right. Uh, there it is. All right, X intercept of the graph is shown, X zero, what's the value of X? Okay, well, we got zero for that Y value, which means it's right there. We see that that's gonna be between six and eight, so it'd be at seven. What is the value of X? That'd be seven. Moving on to number eight. We got function F defined by F of X equals one tenth X minus two. What is the Y intercept of the graph? Y equals F of X in the XY plane, no transformations. Looking for the Y intercept. Well, our Y intercept is gonna be where X is zero, so I can get rid of this and I can get rid of this. Okay, if X is zero, and then I get zero and negative two, so zero and negative two, and so there's gotta be B. Moving on to number nine. I gotta switch sides on my screen again. Okay, now's a great time to go and subscribe if you have not subscribed yet. Okay, I've got a ton of digital SAT prep content. Um, so please go ahead and make sure to subscribe. Here's question number nine. Function f is defined by f of x equals 7x cubed in the xy plane. The graph of y equals g of x is the result. Okay, we got a transformation as a result of shifting y equals f of x down by two units. Okay, so the new one then would have to be down two units. So minus two, which function defines g of x? g of x is going to have to equal 7x cubed minus two. 7x cubed minus two. That's going to be answer choice D. We can go and move on to number 10 now. Got x plus y is equal to 10, or I'm sorry, x plus 7 is equal to 10, x plus 7 squared is equal to y, which ordered pair x, y is the solution to the given system of equations. Okay, if x plus 7 is equal to 10, I can plug in 10 there. I get 10 squared is equal to y. y then must equal 100, since 10 squared is 100. Only option with y is 100 is answer choice A. Moving on to number 11 now. So let me go ahead and switch sides of my screen again. Okay, here's number 11. Got which expression is equivalent to, and then we've got uh, 7x cubed plus 7x, and then all this stuff. So let's go ahead and start with this 7x. 7x minus negative 3x, that's the same as 7x plus 3x. That's going to give us positive 10x. 7x cubed minus 6x cubed will leave us with 1x cubed. So we would have, just double check again, minus minus is a plus. Yep, x cubed plus 10x. x cubed plus 10x, that's answer choice A. Moving on to number 12. Function P is defined by P of n is equal to 7n cubed. What is the value of n when p of n is equal to 56? 56 is equal to 7n cubed. Divide both sides by 7. Uh, this will give us, what is 56 over 7? Uh, that'd be 8. 8 is equal to n cubed. 2 must equal n when you take the third root of each of those. And so there's got to be a. 
uh, since we're just asked for the value of n, always pay attention to what you're asked to answer with, because sometimes it'll be something like n plus one or n plus two or something like that, just to trip you up in case you don't look at that. Uh, moving on to number 13. As you can see, I'm trying to give some good explanations as I go through this. Number 13, now we've got in the figure shown, line C intersects parallel lines S and T. What's the value of X? Okay, just got to solve for X, parallel lines. These lines or these angles correspond to each other. So 180 minus 110 leaves us with 70 as the value of X. Going on to number 14, list of 10 data values is shown. What is the mean of these data? Oh my goodness, they're going to make me sum these when I'm doing a speed run. That's brutal. All right, well, I'm going to put it in my calculator. I'm not going to write it down. Uh, it's going to be 6 plus 8 plus 16 plus 4 plus 17 uh, plus 26 plus 8 and then plus 5 plus 5 plus 5. And that's all over. How many do we got here? We got one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Got 10. So 100 divided by 10, uh, that's going to give us 10 then as the mean of the data. So the mean is going to be 10. Okay, that's a 10 right there. Okay, moving on to question number 15 now. Got to switch sides again. Okay, there's 15. We got the equation E of T is equal to 5 times 1.8 T gives the estimated number of employees where T is the number of years since the restaurant opened, which of the following is the best interpretation of the number five in the context. Okay, this is just exponential growth. Okay, five is that initial value. So that's when uh, the projected number of employees when the restaurant first opens. We have option A, estimated number of employees when the restaurant opened, yes. Uh, moving on to number 16, what is the minimum value of the given function? Uh, okay, x squared is always going to be adding, and then we have plus 55. We can't get less than 55 because obviously x squared is always positive, so minimum value has got to be 55. All right, moving on to number 17. Got to switch sides of my screen again. Now's a great time to go ahead and hit that like button if you have not. Hopefully you are liking this video and enjoying it. Here's 17. Each year, the value of an investment increases by 0.49% of its value of the previous year. Since we're increasing by a percent of our value of the previous year, this will be exponential, which the following functions best models. How the value of the investment changes over time. Okay, well, it can't be linear. It's got to be exponential and it also has to be increasing since it says that it increases in value. Uh, so increasing exponential, okay, the reason is it's based on a percentage of the prior year value. That's exponential growth as long as it's increasing in value. And here's number 18 now. Okay, we got 18. Population of Greenville increased by 7% from 2015 to 2016. If the 2016 population is K times 2015 population, what's the value of K? Okay, so I'm just going to write 2015 population as X so you understand what I'm thinking here. Okay, it's just old population. We're increasing by 7%. So times 1.7 is equal to 2016 population, which we'll just call Y. Okay, what's the value of K? Well, it's K times the 2015. As you can see, we're multiplying that by 1.07. So K would be 1.07. So there's a quick explainer there. Uh, here's 19, which expression is equivalent to A to the power of 11 over 12, where A is positive. I've got um, in my answer choices, uh, nowhere do I just have the 12th root of A to the power of 11, which would be what I would expect, but that's not the case. All of these have 132. Um, so how do I get 11 to 132? Well, let me try 132 over 11 in my calculator. 132 over 11, it's 12, so I need to multiply by 1 over 1. But obviously, we got to do 12 over 12 to get that numerator of 132. So that would give us a to the power of 132 over 144. If I look at my options, then i got to have answer choice B. Moving on to number 20. Let me go ahead and switch sides on my screen again. Okay, here is number 20. We've got... An event planner is planning a party. It costs the event planner a one-time fee of $35 to rent the venue and $10.25 per attendee. I'll represent that as A. The event planner has a budget of $200. What is the greatest number of attendees possible without exceeding the budget? Okay, let's go ahead and subtract 35 from both sides. 165 must be greater than or equal to 10.25A. Divide both sides by 10.25. 165 over 10.25. It's going to give us 16.09. 16.09. 16 we need to be less than or equal to that. Therefore, our answer there for the maximum number of attendees would be 16. Moving on, we've got absolute value. If 4x minus 4 and absolute value is equal to 112, what is the value of, what is the positive value? Always pay attention to positive, negative, things like that. Uh, of x minus 1. So keep in mind, we're not answering with x, we're answering with x minus 1. Let's go ahead and do this uh, extremely quickly. So uh, 4x minus 4, 4x minus 4 is equal to 112. Uh, add 4 to each side, 116. Okay, is equal to 4x. Divide both sides by 4. Okay, 116 divided by 4. That'll give us 29. Did I put that in my calculator right? Yeah, that does. That would be right. Okay. Uh, yeah, so 4x minus 4, add 4 each side, 116, divide both sides by 4. That'll give us 29 is the value of x. Okay, that's perfect because we need the positive value of x minus 1. So 29 minus 1, that'll give us 28. Okay, so our answer there's got to be 28. That's an 8 right there, 28. All right, moving on to number 22. Cube has an edge length of 68 inches. Okay, so I'll just quickly draw a cube, 68. Um, yeah, just pretend that's a cube, whatever. All right, um, a solid sphere with a radius of 34 inches. 
Uh, let me draw that a little bit bigger. Anyway, solid sphere, radius 34 inches. Uh, is inside the cube such that the sphere touches the center of each face of the cube to the nearest cubic inch. What is the volume of the space and the cube not taken up by the sphere? Always pay attention to words that are underlined in the SAT. Okay, so we've got, um, let's first calculate the volume of the cubes. So that's going to be, since it's a cube and the side length is 68, that'd be 68 cubed minus uh, volume of the sphere. So that's going to be four thirds pi r cubed. Uh, our radius is 34 pi r cubed. All right, let's put this in the calculator, see what we get. Okay, so 68 cubed minus four over three multiplied by pi multiplied by 34 to the power of three. And that'll give us 149795, 149795. So A, all right, we can go ahead and move on to number 23 now. Okay, let me try to get up there, switch sides again. Okay, now's a great time to go ahead and drop a comment letting me know what your goal score is and when you're planning to take the digital SAT. Here's question 23, what is the diameter of a circle in the XY plane with this equation? Okay, we need to solve for diameter. We know that this right here is gonna give us our radius. Uh, so we take the square root of our, or I'm sorry, that will get our, our radius squared. So to get to our radius, we do 16 equals r squared. Therefore, we take square root of each side. Our radius then must be four. We're asked for the diameter. Okay, keep in mind, not the radius, even though they try to bait you with this four. Okay, the diameter will be eight since d is equal to two r, so d has to be equal to eight. Okay, moving on to number 24 now. Looks like we got... For the exponential function f, the value of f of 1 is k, where k is a constant, which are the following equivalent forms of the function. f shows the value of k as a coefficient or base. Okay, well, if f of 1 is k, let's go ahead and start putting in 1 for x. Here we have 1 plus 1, which gives the power of 2. 1 1.6 to the power of 2 times 50 will not equal any of the coefficients or bases. Uh, here we'd have 1 1.6 to the power of 1 times 80. Same thing there. It would end up being something greater than 80. Uh, and then right here in C, we'd get 1 minus 1. That'll give us power of 0. 1 1.6 to the power of 0 is equal to 1. Therefore, you'd end up with 1 times 128, and you would end up with f of 1 being 128. So C would have to be our answer, since we do end up equaling out that coefficient of 128 when we have f of 1. All right, so from there, we can go ahead and move on to number 25. So let me go ahead and switch sides on my screen once more. Okay, here is number 25. And I said once more, which I feel like kind of made it sound like we're done, but we're not yet. We still have a couple more questions. Um, a model estimates that at the end of each year from 2015 to 2020, the number of squirrels in the population was 150% more than the number of squirrels in the population at the end of the previous year. Okay, keep in mind that's more than the number of squirrels in the population at the end of the previous year. Model estimates at the end of 2016. Keep in mind that this says 2016, but our start year is 2015, so that's a red flag. There were 180 squirrels in the population, which the following equations represents the model where n is the estimated number of squirrels in the population t years after the end of 2015, and t must be less than or equal to 5. Okay, so we know that our initial value is not actually 180 because that's at the end of 2016, but we start this model at the end of 2015. So C and D have to be wrong. So our initial must be 72. Now we need to determine our growth factor since the exponents are both the same. It says that the number of squirrels in the population was 150% more than the number of squirrels in the population at the end of the previous year. Since it's 150% more, we have to have two and a half as the growth factor. If it was 50% more, then it would be A, but it's not. It's 150% more. Okay, and we got two questions left. We got 26 and 27. Let me go ahead and switch sides of my screen. Okay, I'm trying to give good explanations as I go through this, and I, I'm, it's definitely slowing me down, but that's okay, because I want you guys to actually understand what I'm thinking. Here's 26. In the given pair of equations, A and B are constants. The graph of the pair of equations, the xy plane, is a pair of perpendicular lines, perpendicular lines. Okay, if which of the following pairs of equations also represents a pair of perpendicular lines? Okay, and then we've got all of these. So we can't just look at these because they're going to utilize, it looks like, the value of uh, A and B in all of them. So we need to know A and B. So let's go ahead and solve for A and B. It says that they are perpendicular, therefore they must have uh, the opposite or the negative reciprocals. Okay, and here they're both in standard linear forms, which means you can use the slopes negative A over B. So the slope of this top equation would be negative five over seven. Therefore, the slope in this bottom equation would have to be positive seven over five, um, which would mean that A would have to be a negative seven. And then over here, we would have to have a positive uh, five. So negative seven and then positive five. Okay, and that the reason why it's gotta be negative seven is to keep in mind it's negative a over b, so that would give us that positive seven over five. Okay, now what you notice here is that we've got a seven and a negative seven and then a five and a positive five. So all you're doing is switching the number um, in front of the X to the number in front of the Y and the number in front of the Y up here into the number in front of the X. And then you have to change only one of the signs. If you change both of the signs, you're not going to get the negative part of the negative reciprocal because the sign won't change. Um, so we can use this to move quickly. Okay, look, we see that A is going to equal negative seven. We know that B is going to equal 
a positive five. So we can go ahead and put in our A is negative seven. Okay, that's good. And then a positive five. Okay, this, well, it does end up being a, you know, the 10 switches and the seven switches. We have two sign changes. So A is wrong. We can only have one sign change here. We've got a negative seven there. So we get one sign change. And then here we get plus five times two, which is 10. So now we get 10 Y uh, and 10 X, and then we have seven Y and negative seven X. We do get the sign change and we are switching the coefficient. So B's got to be our answer there. Moving on to our other question on this page, which is 27. So I got to switch sides again. Here's 27. We got in the given equation, C is a constant. The equation has no real solutions. If C is greater than N, what is the least possible value of N? Okay, so no real solutions. It's a quadratic. It's set equal to zero, which means that in order for there to be no real solutions, B squared minus 4AC must be less than zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug in. B is going to be negative 34. Negative 34 squared minus 4 times A. A is just 1 uh, times C, which is just represented as C. What's the least possible value of N? C is greater than N. Okay, from here, pretty easy. Let's go ahead and add 4C to both sides. 4C must be greater than negative 34 squared. Let's plug in negative 34 squared. Uh, 34 squared is going to give us 1156. Negative 34 squared is the same as 34 squared uh, since it's getting squared. So 1156 must be less than 4C. Divide both sides by 4. Okay, divide both sides by 4. 1156 over 4 gives us 289. Okay, so we got 289 must be less than C. We know that N must be less than C. What is the least possible value of n, okay, we can pretty much just write this right below it, right? C must be greater than n. Well, what's the least possible value of n then? 289, so answer has gotta be 289. Now I want you to take Digital SAT Practice Test 3's entire reading and writing section on Blue Book. Once you have submitted the practice test, I want you to review every question you got wrong and make sure you understand both why you got it wrong and how you will avoid making the same mistake in the future. I'll give you 64 minutes to complete the test and 60 minutes to review upon completion. Your time starts now.
Once again, it is time for you to get more timed practice for the math section. To accomplish this, I want you to take Digital SAT Practice Test 2's math module number one. Please take the non-adaptive version from the College Board's website. Open it up as a PDF and take it timed for 43 minutes. This timing is different from the timing you will receive when you take the Digital SAT through Blue Book because there are more questions on the non-adaptive version. Once again, the reason I'm having you use the non-adaptive version in this course is because it would be nearly impossible for me to teach if everyone used the adaptive versions on Bluebook since some people would get different questions than others. Once the time is up, you'll see me do a speed run of the same math module you are about to complete. You can use it to compare your strategies for each question against mine and see if the strategies you are using are efficient or if there are more efficient approaches or methods that you may want to adopt in the future. With that being said, time starts now.
Thanks for completing practice test two's first math module. You will now see me perform a speed run of the same module you just completed. Please compare your strategy for each question to mine and see if you are comfortable with the way you solved each question or if you may want to adopt my approach or strategy. I recommend you use whatever approach and strategy you find most efficient and comfortable for you, even if that is not the strategy I employ. With that being said, here's the speed run. So we have question one. The line graph shows the percent of cars for sale at a used car lot on a given day by model year. I see on my y-axis I have percent of cars for sale, x-axis model year. For what model year is the percent of cars for sale the smallest? I see the smallest uh, percent of cars for sale is going to be occurring in 2014. So my answer there would be C. And I'll go ahead and zoom out a little bit so you guys can see this stuff. Uh, clearly for questions that are a little bit bigger. Okay, so here's question two now. For a particular machine that produces beads, 29 out of every 100 beads it produces have a defect. A bead produced by the machine will be selected at random. What is the probability of selecting a bead that has a defect? Well, we're, since we're selecting them at random, and 29 out of every 100 has a defect, that's going to be 29 out of 100. So we see that that'll be answer choice C. Moving on to question number three. Okay, so I got to switch sides of my screen. So while I do that, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. So that way you can see all my latest videos to help you prepare for the digital SAT. Okay, here's question number three. In the figure, line M is parallel to line N and line T intersects both lines. What is the value of X? Well, this angle here of 33 corresponds with this angle. So now we got that 33. We'll do 188 minus, I'm sorry, 180 minus 33. 180 minus 33. And that will leave us with 147 as the value of X. So our answer has got to be D. Moving on to question number four now. And I got to switch sides. Why don't you go ahead and hit that notification bell? That way you get notified of my new videos and you can continue to prepare well for the digital SAT. Okay, here's question four. What is the y intercept of the graph shown? Y intercept is going to be where x is zero. I see our y intercept then will have a value of negative eight. So it'll be I'm sorry, or a positive eight, zero and positive eight. Okay, so we've got options A, B, C, and D. D would have to be our answer there, zero and positive eight. Number five now, we've got total cost f of x in dollars. To lease a car for 36 months from a particular car dealership is given by f of x equals 36x plus 1,000, where x is the monthly payment in dollars. What is the total cost to lease a car when the monthly payment is 400? We know x represents the monthly payment amount, so that would be 36 times 400, all plus 1,000. I'll go ahead and put that in the calculator. Okay, and I know my handwriting is messy, but that is because I am trying to move fast since this is, after all, a bit of a speed run. So we've got answer choice C there. Once we put that in our calculator, we get $15,400. We can go ahead and move on to question number six. Okay, once again, I gotta go ahead and switch sides of my screen. Okay, this is probably gonna take about five seconds every time I gotta switch sides on my screen. So just letting you know that, uh, just so you can kind of, you know, if you wanted to add that time onto the end as far as like, you know, time that was wasted. But anyways, here's question six. Each side of a square link, each side of a square is a length of 45. What is the perimeter? Okay, perimeter of a square is going to be uh, four times the side length. In this case, our side length is 45. So that would be 180 as the perimeter of the square. Moving on to question number seven. What is the positive solution to the given equation? Okay, keep in mind anytime you're asked positive or negative solution that you do provide that. In this case, let's go ahead and multiply both sides by x plus six. Okay, so now we got x times x plus six. Um, then we got 55. We'll subtract 55 to set it equal to zero. Okay, so now it's set equal to zero. All right, from here, let's go ahead and distribute that x. We'll get x squared plus 6x minus 5. 5 is equal to 0. We'll go ahead and factor uh, what multiplies to negative, five, negative 55. That sums to positive 6. Uh, we got 11 and 5. We'd have to have plus 11 to get that plus 6x. So then we've got these right here. We need the positive solutions. So the positive solution then would be x is equal to 5. Okay, so from here, we can go ahead and keep it moving. Okay, always pay attention to positive versus negative solutions. In this case, the positive, positive solution there is 5. An object travels at a constant speed of 12 centimeters per second. So we got 12 cm per second at this speed. What is the time in seconds that it would take for the object to travel 108 centimeters? So we need to sum up or calculate the distance of 108 centimeters. Okay, we need to solve for how many seconds. So we'll have t seconds. Our seconds will cancel out. And as you can see, we have the correct setup. So from here, we've got 12 t is equal to 108. We divide both sides by 12. We get t is equal to 108 over 12. Okay, we put this in the calculator real quick, or actually we can just see from our answer choices that it's obviously not going to be these, it's got to be nine. But um, yeah, I mean, if you want to put it in your calculator, you can, but there's really no point. Okay, that's going to come out to nine. Moving on to number question nine now. Uh, we've got, let me go ahead and switch the side of the screen again. There it is, question number nine. We got two data sets, it looks like. Data set X and data set Y. The list gives the values in data sets X and Y, which statement correctly compares the mean of data set X and the mean of data set Y. Okay, well, anytime I have two data sets, I'm always going to compare their values or their shapes. In this case, we'll compare their values. I see I've got the same values for the first four on both of them. Only difference is this 27 value, which is greater than uh, what would ultimately be the mean and the maximum of data set X. So the mean for data set Y has to be higher because this 27 is greater than whatever the mean of data set X is. And we know that because it's also greater than the maximum of whatever data set X is, which is 13. 
Uh, so mean of data set X is greater than the mean of data set Y. No, the mean of data set X is less than the mean of data set Y. Yes. Moving on to number 10. Uh, a rocket contained 467,000 kilograms of propellant before launch, exactly 21 seconds <laughs> after launch. Okay, I just noticed I forgot to start my uh, my stopwatch. So I'm going to start that now. Um, and it looks like, yeah, so sorry about that. Forgot to start stopwatch. But you can see from whatever time the video's at. Um, so anyways, we'll keep going. Uh, number 10, a rocket contained 467,000 kilograms of propellant before launch. I mean, at this point, I might as well just get rid of the stopwatch. Let me just get rid of the stopwatch. Okay, there we go. Uh, a rocket contained 467,000 kilograms uh, of propellant before launch, exactly 21 seconds after launch. Uh, 362, 105 kilograms of this propellant remained. On average, how much, uh, approximately how much propellant in kilograms of the rocket burn each second after launch? Okay, so we know that this is how much remains. Okay, this is how much we start with. So we need the difference to figure out how much we burned. So subtract 362, 105. And then divide by that 21 seconds that went by. Okay, we can go ahead and put this in the calculator. All right, four, six, seven, triple O minus three, six, two, one, oh, five. And then divide all that by 21. That gives us four, nine, nine, five. So that's answer choice A. Moving on to number 11. Okay, sorry about forgetting to, to start the stopwatch, but you'll be able to see from the whatever the video's at. All right, here's number 11. Uh, if four X plus two is equal to 12, let's divide 16 X plus eight, anytime I have a question like this where I'm asked for the value of something, it's not just like X or Y, and I also have you know some value set equal to a constant, usually what I'll look to do is see if I can find a ratio. In this case, we see four X plus two. If we multiply that whole thing by four, that'll give us that 16 um, X plus eight. So we can just take this 12 then and also multiply it by four, and that'll give us 48. So our answer has gotta be B. We can go ahead and keep moving on to number 12 now. Okay, number 12, let me go ahead and switch sides on my screen again. All right, so switching sides, now's a great time to go ahead and hit that subscribe button and turn the notification bell on if you have not yet. An object is kicked from a platform equation uh, represents the situation where H is the height of the object above the ground in meters T seconds after it is kicked, which number represents the height in meters from which the object was kicked. In case we need to solve for the height in meters from which the object is kicked, well, that would be at T0 since no time has passed when it is, um, is first kicked. So that would be T of zero, so those become zero. We see that we have this positive nine then as the value of the height so our options are A, B, C, and D. And D is our only answer with nine, so D's gotta be correct. Moving on to 13, given equation defines a function F for what value of X does F of X reach its minimum? Okay, so what you can use here is, I believe it's negative B over two A, okay, is going to give you the X coordinate of your vertex. Okay, and I'm giving a bit of an explanation here, but basically what you have is if you have Y or F of X is equal to a quadratic, what you can do is you can do negative B over 2A and that'll get you the X coordinate of your vertex. Okay, and that's gonna be, you know, if you have something that's opening up like this, since this A value is positive, it'll open up like this. Okay, it looks like a smiley face. Then that'll give you the X coordinate of your minimum. Um, since it is a positive A value, if it was a negative A value, it'd get you the X coordinate of your maximum. Okay, anyway, so that being explained, let's go ahead and just do negative B over 2A. Okay, so that's gonna be negative, negative 50 gets us positive 50. Negative, negative 50 is positive 50 over two times Four, so that'll give us 50 over eight as the value uh, of X at which F of X reaches its minimum. Okay, we can go ahead and move on. So that's 50 over, okay, yep, that looks good. All right, 14 now, we got small business owner budgets, 2,200 to purchase candles. So we got $2,200 to purchase candle. Owner must purchase a minimum of 200 candles. Okay, so minimum of 200 candles. So that will be a minimum uh, to maintain the discounted pricing. If the owner pays $4.90 per candle, so he's paying 4.9 per candle, to purchase small candles, we'll represent that as S, and 11.6 to purchase large candles, so plus 11.6 L for large candles. Uh, what is the maximum number of large candles the owner can purchase to stay within the budget and maintain the discounted pricing? Okay, so his budget is 2200, which means that this sum must be greater than or equal to, and then he also needs to get at least 200 there. Okay, so that's S plus L, since that's the total number of candles. Okay, from here, we need to solve for the uh, number of large candles. So we can go ahead and plug in uh, for S right here, a value that has L in it, and that would be 200 minus L must be less than or equal to S. Okay, from there, let's go ahead and plug that in. Okay, so 200 minus L. And then up here, we still got that plus 11.6 L. All right, let's erase this now. Okay, distribute this 4.9 to both of these. Negative uh, 4.9L plus 11.6L will leave us with 6.7L. Okay, and then we'll have 2200 minus 4.9 times 200. So let me put that in the calculator. Minus 4.9 times 200. Okay, that gets us 1220. 1220 
must be less than or equal to 6.7L, therefore L must be uh, greater than or equal to uh, 1220 over 6.7, 6.7, which is 182. Uh, okay, so L can't be greater than that, so it looks like I, I missed my sign somewhere. Uh, this 2200, oh, that's just the wrong way. I just had it set up the wrong way, yeah. So the 2200, keep in mind that it needs to be greater than since that's his budget. So that's just a silly mistake, but very easy to fix. Okay, so we know that we get 182.08. Okay, we have to be less than that. Uh, and keep in mind that it's very easy to tell that I made that sort of switch on you know the direction of that that sort of arrow right? Because it says what's the maximum number of large candles. So if I get that L must be greater than something, then obviously I had the sign, you know, the wrong way or made some other mistake. But in this case, it was very clear. It was just the sign was the wrong way. So anyways, since L has got to be less than 182.08, the maximum value of it would be 182. So answer is 182. Moving on to question number 15 now. Okay. Number 15, let me go ahead and switch sides. All right, I'm going to try to not explain as much because I obviously I want to teach you guys, but I also do want to keep it, you know, like a speed run. And the linear function F, F of zero is eight. Okay. Y intercepts eight. F of one is uh, 12, which equation defines F, get rid of B, get rid of C, wrong y-intercepts. Between these two, what's the slope? I go over by one, I go up by four, and so there's got to be answer choice D. And then moving on to number 16, function F. Uh, F of W equals 6W squared gives the area of a rectangle in square feet. If it's width W feet and its length is six times its width, which of the following is the best interpretation of F of 14 equals 1176? Uh, well, this 14 represents uh, W, that's going to be our width, uh, and then this 1176 represents our area of the rectangle. We've got option A, if the width of the rectangle is 14 feet, that part is true, and the area of the rectangle is 1176 feet squared, that is true. That's the correct interpretation. Moving on to number 17 now, let me go ahead and switch sides again. Okay, now's a great time to go ahead and turn on that notification bell and comment when you are taking your digital SAT next and what your goal score is. Here's 17, circle has center O, circumference 144 pi, diameters uh, PR and QS, length of arc PS. Okay, so length of arc PS is twice the length of arc PQ. I'll call this uh, arc length X then, and this is twice the length, so that's 2X. What is the length of arc QR? Arc QR is gonna be the same as PS, uh, so therefore we can go ahead and do uh, 144 pi, okay, this, is gonna be 72 pi then, since the whole circumference is 144. Uh, what I just put there, that half circumference would be 72 pi. Then we have to take that and we see that we have uh, PS, which is the same as QR, is two thirds of that, since it's uh, 2X over 3X. So multiply that by two thirds. Okay, that's gonna give us 48 pi, 48 pi. And so there's gotta be B, moving on to number 18 now. A company that provides wheel washing tours takes groups of 21 people at a time. Company's revenue is $80 per adult and $60 uh, per child. Uh, if the company's revenue for one group consisting of adults and children was 1440, uh, how many people in the group were children? Okay, so 21 people at a time, so that'd be C plus A. Uh, we need to solve for C because we need to know how many people were children. Therefore, let's go ahead and plug in for the value of A. We know A is going to equal 21 minus C is equal to positive A. Okay, we go ahead and substitute that in here. Okay, 21 minus C plus 60A, distribute, or this was plus 60C. Right, $60 per child, yep. Okay, we go and distribute the 80 there and the 80 there. Negative 80C plus 60C is gonna leave us with negative 20C. Okay, and then we have 80 times 21, which will give us, I believe, 1680. I'll quick check in the calculator. 21 times 80, 1680, yep. So we're gonna have 1680 minus uh, 20C is equal to 1440. From there, we go ahead and subtract 1680 from both sides. Okay, and then we have 20C. Uh, we can quickly put this in the calculator. 1440 minus 1680. It's going to give us negative 240. Okay, negative 240. Divide both sides by negative 20. C is going to equal negative 240 over uh, negative 20, and that will give us 12, I believe. Yeah, 12. Okay, so our answer there has got to be C. Moving on to number 19 now. Okay, let me go ahead and switch sides of my screen. Now's a great time to go ahead and like this video if you have not already. We'd really, really appreciate that. Here's number 19. Function h is defined by h of x equals 4x plus 28. Graph of y equals h of x in the xy plane as an x-intercept at a0 and y-intercept at 0b, where a and b are constants. What's the value of a plus b? Always pay attention to what I to answer it. In this case, we need to solve for a and b in order to get the value of a plus b, unless we can get a plus b without it. Let's go ahead and take a look. So uh, it looks like in this case, we are going to have to solve for a and b. So we'll have a equals right here. We'll have b equals. All right, let's go ahead and start with a. a is going to be where we have our uh, y value as 0. So that would be 0 is equal to 4x plus 28. Subtract 28 from both sides and then divide by 4. 
Uh, negative 28 over four, give us seven, ne uh, negative seven as the value. Okay, I'll quickly write that out so you can see what I did. Four X plus 28. Okay, we would subtract four X from, or I guess we'll subtract 28 from both sides, right? You get negative 28 is equal to four X, divide both sides by four, get the value of X. You see that's gonna be negative seven. All right, moving on to B, you have zero for X, you put in zero for X, and then you're gonna get zero plus 28. So 28 would be the value of B. Uh, from there, what's the value of A plus B? Okay, 28 plus negative seven, the same as 28 minus seven. Okay, so that's gonna get you 21. All right, moving on to number 20. One of the factors of all of this is a or x plus b, where b is a positive constant. What is the smallest possible value of b? Okay, this it's factorable, but I think it would take a while to go ahead and factor that. So I, this is a great case to use Desmos for. So let's go ahead and pull up Desmos. I'll show that to you. This is the digital SAT, so you will have access to Desmos. On the digital SAT, let's go ahead and plug this in. So I'm going to type this out. So you may hear me be silent a minute because this mic is very sensitive to me not speaking directly into it, and my keyboard is off to the side. Okay, so I'm just typing this in. Uh, keep in mind that you always wanna make sure that you are typing in the correct equation, because if you're not, you're gonna get the question wrong. So always make sure that once you're finished typing it in, you do go back and look to make sure that you typed it in correctly. Okay, so in this case, you got 2x cubed plus 42x squared plus 208x, which I do here. I'll go ahead and zoom in now so we can see where our zeros are at. Okay, keep in mind that it says x plus b. What is the smallest possible value of b? Well, in order for, uh, if we have x plus b, that means that our zero has gotta be negative. Um, because it says b is a positive constant okay so me taking a look at the graph okay we've got one at zero but we know that that can't be it because b is a positive constant okay so we need the smallest value, so that would be at negative eight not negative 13 but negative eight now keep in mind the value of b then has to be eight okay b is a positive constant and it's got to be eight because if you have a zero at negative eight then you would have to have x plus eight and let me write this off to the side so you can see it okay uh or i guess i gotta hide desmos to show you okay keep in mind this is because x plus eight equals zero, then you'd get that x equals negative eight. So the value of b has got to be eight. All right, so from here, let's go ahead and keep on chugging along. We got question number 21, given the system of equations, a is a positive constant, exactly one real solution for the system. What's the value of a? Okay, substitution, put in this negative 1.5. So we got negative 1.5 is equal to x squared plus eight x plus a. Uh, system's got exactly one real solution. So that means we're gonna be having b squared minus four ac is equal to zero. Okay, so from here, let's go ahead and get this set equal to zero. So we're gonna have x squared plus eight x plus a plus 1.5. Since we gotta add 1.5 to each side to set it equal to zero. From here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that c is equal to a plus 1.5, and then I'll have zero is equal to x squared plus nine x, or wait, hang on, why is that not, oh, that's a, okay, yeah, my bad. All right, let me erase this. It'll be zero is equal to x squared plus eight x plus c. Okay, b squared is going to be 8 squared. That'll give us 64 minus 4 times a. a is just 1 times c. Okay, and that's all got to set equal to 0. So 4c is equal to 64. 64 is equal to 4c. Divide both sides by 4. You're just going to get the value of c. 64 over 4 is going to leave you with 16. 16 is the value of c, but we need to get the value of a since that's what we're asked to answer with. So we've got 16 is equal to uh, a plus 1.5. That means that we subtract 1.5 from both sides. That'll leave us with 14.5 is equal to the value of a. So our answer there is going to be 14.5. Okay, that's a decimal, 14.5. Moving on to number 22 now. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch sides of my screen. Okay, I know I'm giving a lot of explanation here. Um, it's kind of a little bit difficult to balance, you know, doing a speed run while also explaining what I'm thinking. Uh, but anyways, here's 22. F of X is equal to all of this. The function F is given, which of the values represents Y is equal to F of X minus three. Okay, well, if F of X is up here, I just need to translate that down three units. I see I'm given my zeros basically. So that'll be negative six, uh, negative five, and at four, negative six, negative five, four, negative six, negative five, four. It looks like all the X values are that. Yes, they are. Okay, that's good. Uh, the Y values then will all have to be at negative three since you know zero times anything is zero and then we're translating it down to three. So all of these Y values must be at negative three. Uh, the only place we have that is an answer choice B. So B would have to be our answer there. We can go ahead and keep moving on. Um, I don't know how much you guys were able to see that question. I hope all of it, because my, my screen does crop off some of it, but uh, I, I am not going to scroll back up. Here's 23. Uh, for the function Q, the value of Q of X decreases by 45%. Uh, for every increase in the value of X by one, if Q of zero is 14, so initial value is 14, which equation defines Q. Okay, initial value is 14, A and B are gone. Difference between C and D is whether we're increasing or decreasing. We're decreasing by 45%. Okay, so our answer there's got to be answer choice C. Moving on to number 24. Okay, I gotta switch sides. Now's a great time to go ahead and hit that notification bell. Make sure it is turned on so you get notified when I post new videos. All right, here's question number 24. I'll go ahead and scroll down so you can see more of it. Graph of y equals f of x plus 14 is shown. Which equation defines function f? Okay, key thing, you always wanna pay attention to any sort of transformations, whether that's up, down, left, right. Okay, in this case, it's uh, the graph of y equals f of x plus 14 is shown. Which equation defines function f? 
Okay, so we need to define f. Now keep in mind, this graph's translated up by 14. So let's go down 14 and then we'll draw f. So we start at two, in order to go down 14, we gotta end at negative 12, which would be about right here. Uh, slope would be the same since our only transformation is down. So it looks something like this. Um, so we have that y uh, intercept. Now keep in mind, this is at negative 12. Let me draw right negative 12 right there. Okay, because so we're down 14. Uh, defines function f. Okay, all of them have the same slope, so that's chill. We can go and look at the y-intercepts. Uh, we got these that are positive. We know that's not the case. And then we got negative 14, negative 12. We know it's got to be at negative 12. Uh, so our answer has got to be a. We can go and move on to number 25. Let me go ahead and switch the side of my screen so you can see the function or the question. Uh, in this case, it's a triangle question. Okay, so we've got side lengths of right triangle RST are given. Triangle RST is similar to triangle UVW, where S corresponds to uh, S corresponds to V and T corresponds to W. Yep, so it's just in the same order. That's good. What is the value of tangent W? Okay, let's go ahead and draw RST. Okay, I don't really care if these are like proportional at all. Um, okay, so we've got RST. We're told that T is what? Which one's the right angle, does it say? Uh, triangle RST is similar. Side lengths of right triangle RST are given. Okay, well, we'll just use 52. Um, and then we got, let's go RST. T, okay, R to T is 52, R to S is 20, and then S to T is 48. Okay, from here, we're asked, what's the tangent W? Uh, let's find what W corresponds to. W is going to correspond to T. So we just need the value of tangent T since these are similar. All right, so we need tangent T. Okay, we can use SOHCAHTOA, so opposite over adjacent, tangent opposite over adjacent, uh, 20 over 48, so that's not an option. We need to simplify. Uh, let's go ahead and divide both sides by, looks like we can do four, so that would give us five over 12. That's gonna be answer choice B. Okay, so we can go and move on to number 26 now. We're gonna have to switch sides on my screen, so now's a great time to go ahead and comment and let me know what your goal score is and what date you are planning on taking the SAT, or the digital SAT for that matter. Here's number 26. We got one gallon of paint will cover 220 square feet of a surface. Uh, so 220 square feet is what one gallon of paint will cover. So that's the amount of square feet we get per gallon. Uh, a room has a total wall area of W square feet. Okay, so wall area is W. Which equation represents total amount of paint P in gallons? You need to paint the walls of the room twice. Okay, so we got to paint the walls of the room twice. We know the total wall area is W, so we need whatever this is to equal 2W. Okay, we need to get rid of gallons. Okay, so we need the amount of paint P in gallons. So P gallons, our gallons will cancel. We're going to be left with square feet equals square feet since 2W is representative of our area in square feet. So that's good. Okay, so from here, let's go ahead and write this out in a way that, you know, doesn't have as many letters in it, just so it's easier for me to show you. That's going to be 220 multiplied by P for our number of gallons is equal to 2w. We need to solve what p is equal to, so simple rearrangement here. We're just going to have p is going to equal 2w over 220. And as you can see, we can pull out a 2 in the top and the bottom. When we do that, we're going to be left with w over 110. Okay, so we got w over 110. It's going to be its choice A. Moving on to number 27 now. Let me go ahead and switch sides of my screen so you can see number 27. The number A is 110% greater than the number B. Uh, the number B B is 90% less than 47. What is the value of A? Okay, I would have written this out as I was writing, but I was moving my screen. So we've got number A is 110% greater than number B. So A is equal to uh, 2.1B, since it's 110% greater, not 110% of. Uh, number B is 90% less than 47. So 0 0.1 times 47 is the same as that. What is the value of A? Well, this will equal 4.7. That's gonna equal 2.1 times 4.7. Okay, let's go ahead and put this in the calculator and that will give us our answer. 2.1 times 4.7 gives us 9.87. Okay, so A is gonna equal 9.87. Okay, so 9.87 be the answer there. Now, I want you to start by reviewing every question you've gotten wrong on any practice test you have taken so far. Make sure you are now able to answer it correctly and understand what you did wrong before. After reviewing all your past incorrect answers, I want you to spend at least one hour doing similar practice questions to those you got wrong using either Khan Academy or other digital SAT practice tests from the College Board. With that being said, I'm going to start a timer for one hour and you can begin now.
Now that you've completed this course, I want to talk about what you should do if you still have time before your next SAT. This course should have given you a very strong foundation on how to approach and answer questions. From here, you should try to focus on your weaknesses. You can do this by taking a look at your past one to three practice tests and diagnose which question types you're still struggling with. From there, use Khan Academy or old practice test to continually practice those questions until you have reached your proficiency. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and consider sending a super thanks to help support my channel. Additionally, please drop a comment below letting me know what videos you want me to make in the future. And if you are looking for additional educational services that I offer, please check out my website, haydenrody.com.